everybody. Hello, Edu. Hello, Sergio. Who are you? Welcome. I'm very well, thank you. Welcome, everyone, to our second virtual coffee. I'll be sharing now my screen. Uh, my name is Sergio Gonzalez Olaichea, and I'm the business development manager at Plain Concepts. Maybe, Edu, would you, you would like to present yourself? Yes, of course. My name is Edu Eduard Tomas, and I work as a principal tech lead in Plain Concepts in the Barcelona office. Thank you. Today we'll be discussing uh, our three of our recent cases, how we've applied technology in the financial world. We'll be seeing what challenges our customers had and what we did to overcome them. Uh, before entering the cases, I'll make a brief uh, presentation of our company for those of us uh, who are listening. Sergio, Sergio, sorry, yes. sorry to interrupt you. Can you please project the PPT at full screen? Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Just to ensure that everyone sees it better. Yes, as I was saying, we'll, uh, we'll be going through the cases. I will understand, uh, we'll explain what were the challenges facing uh, our clients, uh, what we did uh, to overcome them. But before that, we'll make a very brief presentation of our company, Plain Concepts. Uh, our company started 14 years ago by four Microsoft MVPs. Uh, we are a software development boutique. Uh, specialized in working with the latest uh, technological innovations to provide uh, custom-made solutions for our clients. Since our humble beginnings, we have grown considerably and we are currently more than 350 employees. In our staff, we have uh, 12 uh, MVPs and we are one of the few companies in the world having two MVPs of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, our offices uh, go from Seattle uh, to Dubai with our most recent openings in Frankfurt and Amsterdam. Uh, thanks to the trust of our customers, we have been able to de deliver more than 2,000 successful projects, giving us an unprecedented uh, knowledge on many different industries. Also thanks to them, we have been awarded multiple awards in the last years. We are a cloud solutions uh, provider, a cloud solutions service provider, and we believe AI is impacting every single one of our services and will continue impacting. Now we'll get directly on uh, case number one. Please, for the listeners, uh, feel free uh, to shoot us a question and we'll We'll make us a brief pause every case, so you're able to, uh, so we're able to answer them. And the case, the first case, is how we were able to handle millions of daily transactions uh, while providing relevant data to the merchants. Our client is a top payment solution in Spain that has more than 300,000 300, customers, and we developed for them a platform that was able to ingest, store, and process up to 10 million daily transactions. Our clients' customers, this is what they were seeing before we developed a such platform. They had no relevant data and they will only get an Excel file 24 hours later, uh, where as you can see, it was very hard to apply any kind of business intelligence or uh, advanced analytics. We uh, start proposing a cloud solution uh, to our client, but definitely our client faced a lot of, uh, he was pretty scared and a lot of challenges because every time we talk, that we talk about cloud and financial uh, information, uh, it spikes uh, uh, and creates a lot of uh, stress. Uh, Edu, could you please explain us some of the challenges uh, banks are facing when it comes to cloud environments, uh, security, and how we were able to overcome them. Yes, so the first most important thing is to put clear the boundaries between what is what's on PCI and non-PCI zones, because everything that's on PCI needs to run on a very high secure standards and high secure environment. 
that's the first step to do. Uh, then, uh, for instance, we worked with infrastructure department of the customer to ensure that we were able to translate from what they have on-prem to the cloud and also by the security department because uh, they have a lot of uh, security procedures in place and they want to keep at least the same security level in the cloud. So that means that you need to analyze all the cloud products and say, okay, uh, does this product support, I don't know, uh, uh, encryption? And if they support encryption, can you manage the keys? How you manage the keys? Or maybe the keys are managed by 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 cloud provider. Is uh, this uh, product able to run in a private virtual network? Whatever. So uh, you need to understand all the cloud products in terms of, of security features and then choose the best option. But I think that is the, the, the most important thing. First, clear, separate the boundaries between PCI and non-PCI and then start going by product by, by product and trying to match the security characteristics of the product to the requirements by the customer. Thank you, Edu. Uh, I know another of the challenges we had, because as I uh, previously mentioned, at, uh, at the end of the, when we delivered the project, we were able now to process up to 10 million daily transactions. The listener has to understand, it's just, it's just not transactions 10 million today, we're also counting the ones of yesterday, the ones of the day before. Uh, how do we manage uh, to build such infrastructure and which challenges do we face, Edu? The most important challenge here was not the ingestion of the big data ingestion itself, was to being able to ingest in some way that allow for uh, KPAs. So the customer asks for a lot of KPAs uh, for their transactions. So we need to ingest all data and then automatically make some aggregate by day, by month, uh, just to be sure that we were able to provide those KPAs. Also, uh, we finally ended with a multi-tenant data aggregation in which each merchant of set of small merchants were treated like a separate tenant because that was the best way to scale uh, the system. And for more, in a more technical way, what uh, we used in that project was an HD Insights Hive cluster so we get all the data in a storage. We start up an HD Insight cluster uh, with some nodes, process all the data, and then we shut down the cluster. This allows us to have all the power of a hive and also maintains the cost as low as possible because we only keep the cluster running the minimum time uh, needed for the uh, ingestion. Uh, we use uh, HD Insights, uh, which was mm, the solution that were available at this time, but for but there are also a new a new there are also other solutions that we could use here like Spark or Databricks, for example. Fantastic. As Ed was mentioning, we were creating several aggregators because we had the other part of the pro of the project, which was the web portal that uh, all of these 350,000 uh, customers could see. Uh, this was useful uh, because we have to bear in mind that the clients' customers were very were big, were completely different. It could be a multinational that had operations in multiple countries, as it could be a small shop owner, shop owner. Uh, this information, this was some of the filters the uh, each each of the users would make in the uh, in, in the web portal. So they will be able to see and categorize the the transactions by age, uh, by gender. They could also see which countries were uh, which origin of the of the countries the the customers were coming. Uh, this tool allowed them. Uh, to create even some comparison or forecasting. For example, imagine a small uh, coffee shop that could compare with the same postal zip code, how were the sales on uh, at a certain time of the day on neighboring uh, coffee shops that would obviously would be also on the platform. You know, They could also apply forecasting using this information, let's say as a, a place that had 
some certain indicators, weather conditions, like on a sunny day, they received more tourists from a certain location, which let's imagine they consume more uh, Fanta, you know, uh, bearing, in, bearing in mind those characteristics, they could uh, stock themselves better so they wouldn't run out of stocks. Uh, this is the, the explanation from our side. I don't know if Edu, we have any question concerning uh, concerning this first case. No, right now. Jump to the second one. No, no. I think that we can go ahead. Okay. Our second case is the creation of a platform simplifying third parties access for bank categorization and uh, credit scoring. Our client is a worldwide uh, credit scoring company that has operations in more than 35 countries. Uh, we created for them an entire microservice platform with uh, two entry points through an API and web uh, that will allow them a simple integration uh, for more uh, to have a wider reach uh, in customers. Now, let me give you an example. Uh, our client, let's talk about, for example, the car industry. Our client uh, had uh, customers such as, for example, Mercedes-Benz, they have their own financial service department and they have the capacity, financial capacity and engineering know-how to adapt their, their systems to our client's bank authorization uh, tool. The problem was with other, uh, other entities. Imagine in your city, uh, any multi-brand uh, dealership, you know, that has five, ten uh, stores, you know, it's not as big as obviously as, as Mercedes-Benz and doesn't have the, neither the financial capacity or the, or the, the technological know-how, how to adapt. Our client therefore asked us if we could create this uh, platform that allowed in a dual entry point and it could connect th those customers. So. Let's imagine now, as we can see in the picture, a family came, wanted to purchase a car and they would apply for a loan. You know, as I'm sure most of the people listening uh, has happened, you would re either receive uh, an email or an SMS asking you to accept certain conditions in order uh, to transfer that information to have a better understanding of your credit uh, report. How would it work? It would either you would either be accepting the SMS or the email, go to the bank directly, uh, which will be integrating with a PCI compliance, uh, like for example, Eurobit or PCE. We will process such information and then uh, finally to the bank authorization. Option number two, instead of connecting directly with the bank, we will get the bank credentials, the bank transactions, and we will process them uh, to fill them in into the to the bank authorization. I'll show now the architecture. Uh, Edu, could you please uh, explain why did we build such a microservice architecture uh, using Kubernetes? Well, um, the answer for why we uh, why we built a distributed microservice architecture was before there are clearly separated pieces. Uh, some of them uh, were already developed, some of them developed by us to integrate the project, so it fit very well in a microservices culture. Um, so we could uh, develop each part more or less independently. Also, uh, each service has their own requirements about scalability and uh, security. And for the Kubernetes, is the final runtime was an OpenShift, which is an enterprise flavor of Kubernetes provided by Red Hat. And that was not only for our system, but also the idea was to use OpenShift as the main um, runtime platform for the entire company. So we not only put our software in the OpenShift, but also all the needed infrastructure like MySQL databases in this case, were running as containers in OpenShift. Could you walk us through how do we connect, because we had some challenges here, the existing and it was critical for a client, they had their own bank authorization. Uh, how we were able to connect those existing uh, categorization or bank readers uh, for that, we basically built an abstraction layer, 
So we basically define our abstract categorizer and then we build a translation, a translation microservice for each specific uh, implementation. That basically allow, allow us to uh, add any categorizer uh, without changing any of the other services. Uh, again, uh, also, sorry, the, all the communications between services were fully decoupled and we were using asynchronous uh, queues. Fantastic. And uh, could you give some indications why is it cost effective uh, to use such an architecture in this case and how it helps us to scale up on our needs? The principal benefit to use OpenShift or uh, Kubernetes approach is that first we were able to deploy, update and the scale in, scale out any uh, service uh, independently and that's an important point and also we were able to uh, put more services in a single machine so the, the, the density of services per node were higher, so that also is a cost uh, reduction. With fewer machines, you are able to run more uh, services than if you deployed that service uh, independently on their own virtual machine. Great. Once, once the platform was built, the optimi, uh, optimal challenge from our client, they had it's uh, mentioned bank catheterization, which they were applying already artificial intelligence. But as we were now talking with about two databases, the one uh, the business uh, the one the business one generated from the application and the te technical one from the process, how uh, were we able to feed uh, and how do we we prepare in order to expand all, all, all of the data so their uh, existing artificial intelligence algorithms and what we provided could be applied in, in, in a major way. Yes, that's important because having all centralized data, okay, instead of having them separately and now the data was accessible for the whole system, we were able to apply machine learning algorithms to do um, automatic scoring classification, which is uh, which was very interesting uh, because we first we um, we have integrations with uh, many banks, so we don't have only the specific bank movements for one bank. We can have more movements from other banks, so we can have uh, more or less uh, their banking history. We also can categorize this movement, so we know um, on what is spending the money. And based on all the, on all the data, we are able to, uh, using machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence, perform automatic scoring classification, which was very powerful. Fantastic. So today we're processing more than 2000 daily requests uh, and that has made definitely our client recoup its investment uh, pretty fast. Uh, could you please tell us also, uh, because we talked about the, the entry point, how did the institutions were receiving the, the files? Yes, so in this case, just to clarify, when we talk about the institution, it's not about the final customer, you or me, that is going to buy yes. a car, in your example, <laughs> is the car uh, dealer in this case. Uh, basically, uh, our system is fully uh, independent on what the output can be, but we implemented the two needed outputs that were requested by the customer, that were an FTP, a secure FTP, where the, the car dealer in this case can uh, grab the data or a webhook uh, that allowed for more large uh, enterprises to integrate the uh, rest, the scoring uh, classification to integrate these results in their own automated process. Cool. And one last question concerning uh, this case. I'm sure we have some listeners that are thinking, wow, this seems uh, fantastic, but it maybe takes ages. Uh, could you please uh, tell us uh, how long it took us to finish the, the project? And could you explain and give some detail of some of the of the challenges we also find there, you know, that uh, making this, the project ourselves? Yes, first the round numbers. OK, the entire project was more or less developed by nine months, three persons. OK, mm -hmm. that was the effort, more or less in time and, uh, and uh, men days. And now the other part of the question is um, 
how we were iterating uh, in the in the features okay so first uh, in this case in the customer as we choose to use openshift openshift has a lot of enter pressure features that we could use for that and for instance every service that you start developing needs to uh, start developing using a base image approved by the the organization okay uh, also that uh, we deploy first in a development environment and then we're a board of architects that first analyze the architecture and give their green red light and feedback what do you what needs to be improved and this is because our system is not alone our system may need to, may need to interact with other systems and also uh, we need to keep in mind that the entire uh, organization will run inside the open sheet not only our not only our 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 project uh, once the architect to uh, the architect board is say that okay uh, we go again to security security team security team basically performs any kind of automatic and penetration testing and based on their reports we can go ahead or we need to reimplement parts of the system and then if we go ahead we can start applying on the test environment which is separated tester team does and performs any kind of automated and manual monkey validation whatever they need to do to ensure that everything is working as uh, expected and finally if everything goes well we can deploy to production that's for the internal api the internal services for the external services the, exter the services that, that are exposed uh, to outside using an api gateway which was happy in this case uh, we had a similar process but we were guided by a committee of uh, ipg experts uh, people that basically have a high degree in uh, ipg knowledge that uh, guided us uh, with some recommendations about the policy transformations security management of epg uh, whatever that was more or less the full picture okay before we move to our third and, and final case uh do any, any of the listeners would like to make any questions i don't know Edu, if you see any questions there not right now okay we'll move to the third and last case, which is invisible payments uh, for retailers, allowing a speeding up of store queues at the cashier. Our client is uh, one of the biggest retailers in its sector and wanted to have a payment functionality uh, within its app. Uh, today, we are handling more than 200,000 monthly transactions. And I'll walk you now through the, the which were the main goals our client had. Number one, as they had already an existing app, they wanted to create an astonishing, uh, cool uh, payment uh, functionality that would engage their, their customers and they would spend more time on the app. Their second of their goals was to reduce the store queues. They wanted to see if such payment method would allow them to reduce the queues generated at the stores so more people could pass uh, in a faster way. So, oh, let me walk you through the customer journey. Our friend here would uh, arrive to the cashier, would pop up his cell phone, you know, apply to press on within the app on the payment functionality, and a QR code would be created. You know, the cashier will read the QR code, and this is important, and the customer would put his phone on his pocket and he would never have need of it. You know, cashier reads the QR code and automatically before swapping any of the products is able to understand is there's any promotions, any discounts uh, that this customer has, you know, all the products will be swapped. And once the products will be swapped, automatically it will be generated a token that would validate the, the transaction. So, what we allowed was uh, compared to other uh, traditional payment methods, we were able to record it and we were, our method that we called invisible payments was uh, 40% uh, faster than, than cash or credit card. Not only that, 
as we mentioned, we, it's currently being uh, implemented. It's currently processing more than 200,000 uh, monthly payments, and already has the infrastructure ready. When our when our client decides to go, for example, to uh, auto checkout uh, cashiers. Uh, Edu, could you walk us please uh, through the flow of the transaction and why we decide to build uh, such uh, payments functionality on the cloud? Mm -hmm. Yes, basically scalability in this case. So we need to be aware that this whole system needs to serve or needs to be deployed uh, more or less against 10,000 shops across Europe. Okay, so we need to have a system that was once very scalable and second, high available. And the cloud is the best platform to provide those things. Okay, and as we were, we were with different countries, we had to integrate with uh, multiple PSP services, uh, being each of them different. How we were able to create this? That's, that's basically, well, first, um, to provide the flow that you mentioned before, when you show the QR, uh, you need to put your credit card information in the application but we wanted to have credit card information in the application because if we do that if we store credit card information payment method information we need to be pci and that adds a lot of complexity to the solution so basically we defer that on a psp that means that when you add your credit card information in the app you are redirected to the psp page okay and then is the psp the one that um, asks the credit card, validates that the credit card is valid, and uh, during this process, you probably will receive a second authentication factor from your bank, an SMS, a coordinate, whatever. Okay, just to ensure that are yourself the one that are adding uh, your card. This process is uh, performed once, and. Uh, once the PSP has validated the cards, the application receives a token, a PSP generated token. Okay, and then uh, the application can use this token to make payments on behalf of the user. The QR that uh, the user is showing at the, at the cache is not the, the token itself is the reference to an internal ID that allows the backend to get that token. Uh, so the application is independently about the PSP and the backend, as they have an internal ID, uh, we have specific implementations for each uh, PSP. So basically we define a set of interfaces that each PSP uh, needs to uh, have and we implement those interfaces for all the needed PSP. So basically that allows us to adapt to any existing or future PSP in, in any country. Great. I have, I mean, I mean, maybe some of our listeners are making the, the same question. I enroll, you know, I download the app. I'm already part of the of the of the retailer's app. I decide to enroll my credit card, and at the moment, I have money, and the moment I may go pick, make a purchase for some reason, I but, uh, I get a, a receipt, and and I don't have money in this credit card. My question is, how how is the re Taylor, in this in this side, uh, secure that all the payments are are being are, are trustworthy. Yes, we don't process payments. The application don't process payments. The payments are processed through PSP. So in this case, the retailer has the same security and confidence as if the user used their own physical credit card to do the payment. So as in the case of as uh, because I'm, I'm sure it's. Maybe we mentioned very fast, you know, we just show the mm -hmm. form once with the QR code, then a token is being generated. In case of my credit card did not have funds, no token would be generated and we would not uh, be able to process the payment, correct? Exactly. If you have no funds, the payment won't be processed by the PSP. So the, the, the dealer has exactly the same confidence because it's the same from the PSP point of view is exactly the same that if you have just paid with your physical credit card. Okay, fantastic. 
for those listeners from our side, this is all. We welcome now the any question. I don't know if Edu, you, you yes. were able to... Yes, we have a couple of questions right now. One's from Natalia. Uh, that's related from the second case, not the okay, slide. I'll go back. Okay. I'll go back to the. Okay, and the question is if uh, we can explain the next. How does the process of primary integration with a bank works? Um, I'm not sure exactly what she's referring on the question, so maybe I don't know, Sergio, if you you have the question what, clearer. What does the? Can you go what, again? Yes. Uh, how does the process of primary integration with a bank work? So I'm not I'm not sure if he's asking from an organizational point of view, from a technical point of view. I think maybe Edu, if if she's listening, maybe it's better if she can uh, ask. Uh, because it, if she's asking how uh, if how the integration with the bank, as as we mentioned, we we were we had two options. Either we were getting the we were being getting connected with the bank itself, and uh, therefore we had the bank reader, which was processing all the information before we were actually fitting it to the categorizer. Or if she meant by the by the bank transactions. That is what I'm not sure because if if it was through the bank transactions, we would process them ourselves and then feed them to the categorizer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Has she has she answered or has she been able? Okay, uh, let's wait if she writes something else. Uh, then jump to next question uh, from Charles, uh, which is uh, in your experience, what are the most important challenges for the financial projects around the cloud and focus when you need to integrate some text? So for me, from my point of view, which is mainly technical point of view, the most important challenge for financial projects around the cloud are one, a lot of financial organizations have very big CPDs on premise. Okay, so they have their own infrastructure built with their own security requirements, their own security team, management team, etc. So um, you need a cloud that needs to provide a very solid hybrid cloud solutions because at any at, at, at some point you will need to integrate some of the services that are on the cloud with some of the services that are run on premises and you need to do that integration in a way that makes the security team happy which is not easier so uh, the first of all is okay it's not it's not as easy as okay let's go and go to cloud and we build everything on the cloud because they will say maybe okay we go to the cloud this cloud seems secure to us it's okay but wait we have our own database our own host whatever our systems processor that uh, that's on premise and uh, we want we cannot and we want move that to the cloud so you need to integrate and you need to do that in a way that's uh, secure and feasible so I think that's the most important thing so uh, you need to understand very deeply which are the security features of the cloud platform that uh, you choose and be sure that this cloud provides all the security mechanisms that you will need for the project okay yes. that's for and me Ed, the most important thing and Ed, we've, we've we've found this in many cases at the end uh, the client has to be convinced uh, and has to be ready uh, to go to the cloud because when it comes to security, uh, regardless of which is uh, the, the provider, let's say for example you're working with Microsoft Azure, you have to bear in mind they're investing more than a billion dollars every year and they have more than 4,000 security engineers protecting the network. No, regardless how big your company is, you'll never be able uh, to 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 have such a, a power in, in, in protection of security. So what we faced, Edu, is the client has to be convinced that they want to go, they want to move to cloud, they have to be able to understand particularly, as Edu was defining, which is the cloud that fulfills all of their needs. But it's very important that the, that the client is already on board, because if not, it's uh, we just telling them, telling them, but we need, we need that, that, that ready to go from their side. 
Okay. And just uh, Natalia just pointed out that she, for the question that we were answering before about the primary bank integration, uh, she just pointed out that is about the technical point of view. And uh, for that, I will only point that um, I will only say that um, there is not clearly an unique way that you as an organization can access or request the bank, the, the, the financial movements of a bank's customers. So you need to have a deal with the bank and they, the bank, will pro, will provide you the mechanisms or will say you the mechanisms on how and when and under which circumstances you can access to the financial data. Okay, so it's very uh, ad hoc for uh, each bank in this case. Okay, so it's not a single single thing that uh, you say, okay, I will use this API or whatever. There are a lot of ways to do that and it depends on the deals that you have uh, with the bank in this case. Eddie, do we have any other questions? No, right now. It's important for our listeners, we'll keep open for another minute, that if you have any question, we'll be uh, making follow-up uh, through email. Please shoot us a line. Uh, we'll be happy to jump online, Edward, myself, if you want to be, any of the cases wants to be explained in a deeper uh, capacity. Uh, we're completely available for you guys. Okay, uh, Natalia has also clarification. Uh, from a legal point of view too, I cannot answer that part of the question. So what are the legally deals? But I think that's, um, that's everything about the deal that you as organization do with the bank uh, to request the financial movements about customers, okay? And I think that's probably a thing that can be different by country or by region or whatever. I'm not sure, Sergio, if you have more information about that? No, I cannot. Uh, as you said, it varies a lot. It's uh, case per case. Uh, but what uh, Natalia, what we can do if you have, uh, there's a concrete need for a concrete uh, country, we could, we could uh, definitely look into it. But uh, I'm not the right person to answer the, the, legal, uh, the legal issue. Okay. Okay then. Uh, thank you everyone who joined for listening in. Uh, Edu, thank you for doing such a fantastic job like, like always. Uh, it's been a pleasure uh, having this virtual coffee with you guys. Keep tuned. We'll be uh, having regular sessions uh, within this week and following weeks. And once again, thank you very much for your time. Okay. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye-bye.